When you're cruising down the road in the fast lane and you lazily sail past a few hard driving cars and are feeling pretty pleased with yourself and then accidentally change down from fourth to first instead of third, thus making your engine leap out of your bonnet in a rather ugly mess, it tends to throw you off your stride in much the same way that this remark threw Ford Prefect off his. Uh, what? I said we've met. Zephod gave an awkward start of surprise and jabbed the gum sharply. Hey, uh... Ha have we? Hey, uh... Ford rounded on Arthur with an angry flash in his eyes. Now he felt he was back on home ground. He suddenly began to resent having lumbered himself with this ignorant primitive who knew as much about the affairs of the galaxy as an Ilford-based gnat knew about his life in Peking. What do you mean you've met? This is Zaphod Beeblebrox from Beetlejuice 5, you know. Not bloody Martin Smith from Croydon. I don't care, said Arthur coldly. We've met, haven't we, Zephod Beeblebrox? Or should I say, Phil? What? shouted Ford. You'll have to remind me, said Zaphod. Ah, <laughs> I have a terrible memory for species. It was at a party, pursued Arthur. Yeah, well, I doubt that. Cool it, will you, Arthur? Arthur would not be deterred. A party, a party, a party six months ago on Earth, England. Zephyr shook his, shook his head in a tight-lipped smile. London. Islington. Islington. Oh, said Zaphod with a guilty start. That party. That party. That wasn't fair and forward at all. He looked backwards and forwards between Arthur and Zaphod. What? He said to Zaphod. You mean to say you've been on that miserable little planet as well, do you? No, of... of no, of, of course not. Well, I may have just dropped in briefly, you know, on my way somewhere. But I was stuck there for 15 years. Well, I, I didn't know that, did I? But what were you doing then? L looking about, you know. He gate-crashed a potty. No, that's not right. It's hard to go back and forth in three times. He gate-crashed a potty. He gate-crashed a potty said Arthur, trembling with anger. A fancy dress party? It would have to be, wouldn't it? At this party, persisted Arthur, was a girl. Oh, well, look, it doesn't matter now. The whole place was gone up in smoke anyway. I wish you'd stop sulking about that bloody planet. Who was the lady? Oh, just somebody. Well, all, all right. I wasn't doing very well with her. I'd been trying all evening. Hell, she was something, though. Beautiful, charming, devastatingly intelligent. At, at last I'd got her to talk to... At last I'd got her to myself for a bit and was playing, plying her up with a bit of talk when this friend of yours barges up and says, Hey, doll, is this guy bothering you? No, no, I gotta do it. In the... Hey, doll, is this guy bothering you? Why don't you talk to me instead? I'm from a different planet. I never saw, I never saw her again. Zaphod? Yes, said Arthur, glaring at him and trying not to feel foolish. He only had two arms and the one head, and he called himself Phil, but... But you must admit, he did turn out to be from another planet, said Trillian, wandering into sight of the other end of the bridge. She gave Arthur a pleasant smile, which settled on him like a ton of bricks, and then turned her attention to the ship's controls again. There was silence for a few seconds, and then out of the scrambled mess of Arthur's brain crawled some words. Tr Trisha McMillan? What are you doing here? Same as you. I hitched a lift. After all, with a degree in maths and another in astrophysics, what else was there to do? It was either that or the idle queue again on Monday or the dole queue again on Monday. In infinity minus one, chattered the computer. Improbability sum, sum now complete. Zaphod looked about him, at, Ar at Ford, at Arthur, and then at Trillian. Uh, Trillian, is this sort of thing gonna happen every time we use the improbability drive? Very probably, I'm afraid, she said. Now I've learned she's probably British, so I've been doing a voice round, but that's okay. 
Chapter 14. The Heart of Gold fled on silently through the night of space, now on a conventional photon drive. Its crew of four were ill at ease knowing that they had been brought together not of their own volition or by simple coincidence, but by some curious perversion of physics, as if relationships between people were susceptible to the same laws that governed the relationships between atoms and molecules. As the ship's artificial night closed in, they were each, each grateful to retire to separate cabins and try to rationalize their thoughts. Trillian couldn't sleep. She was, on, she was on a couch and stared at a small cage which contained her last and only links to Earth, two white mice that she had insisted Zaphod let her bring. She would expect it never to see the planet again, but she was disturbed by her negative reaction to the news of the planet's destruction. It seemed remote and unreal, and she could no, find no thoughts to think about it. She watched the mice scurry around the cage and running furiously in her little plastic tread, tread wheels, she watched the mice scurrying around the cage and running furiously in their little plastic tread wheels till they occupied their, her whole attention. Suddenly, she took her, shook herself and went back up to the bridge to watch over the tiny flashing lights and figures that charted the ship's progress through the void. She wished she knew what she was trying not to think about. Zephod couldn't sleep. He also wished he knew what it was he wouldn't let himself think about. For as long as he could remember, he'd suffered from a vague, nagging feeling of being not all there. Most of the time, he was able to put this thought aside and not worry about it, but it had been reawakened by the sudden inexpl inexplicable arrival of Ford Prefect and Arthur Dent. Somehow, it seemed to conform to a pattern that he couldn't see. Ford couldn't sleep. He was too excited about being back on the road again. Fifteen years of virtual imprisonment were over, just as he was finally beginning to give up hope. Knocking about with Zaphod for a bit promised to be a lot of fun, though there seemed to be something faintly odd about his semi-cousin that he couldn't put his finger on. The fact that he had become president of the galaxy was frankly astonishing, as was the manner of his leaving the post. Was there a reason behind it? There would be no point in asking Zaphod. He never appeared to have a reason for anything he did at all. He had turned unfathomability into an art form. He attacked everything in life with a mixture of extraordinary genius and naive incompetence, and it was often difficult to tell which was which. Arthur slept. He was terribly tired. There was a tap at Zaphod's door. It slid open. Zaphod? Yeah? Trillian stood outlined in the oval of light. I think we just found what you came to look for. Hey, yeah? Ford gave up the attempt to sleep. In the corner of his cabin was a small computer screen and a keyboard. He sat at, sat at it for a while and tried to compose a new entry for the guide on the subject of Vogons, but couldn't think of anything vitriolic enough, so he gave that up too, wrapped a robe around himself, and went for a walk to the bridge. As he entered, he was surprised to see two figures hunch excitedly over the instruments. See? The ship's about to move into orbit, Trillian was saying. There's a planet out there. It's at the exact coordinates you predicted. Zephod had heard a noise and looked up. Ford! He hissed. Hey! Ford! Hey, come take a look at this. Ford went and had a look at it. It was a series of figures flickering over a screen. You recognize those galactic coordinates? No. I'll give you a clue. Computer! Hi, gang, enthused the computer. This is getting real sociable, isn't it? Shut up, said Zaphod, and show up the screens. Lights on the bridge sank. Pinpoints of light played across the consoles and reflected in four pairs of eyes that stared up at the external monitor screens. There was absolutely nothing on them. Recognize that? whispered Zaphod. Ford frowned. Um, no, he said. What do you see? N nothing. Recognize it? W what are you talking about? We're in the Horsehead Nebula. One whole vast dark cloud. And I was meant to recognize that from a blank screen? Inside a dark nebula is the only place in the galaxy you'd see a dark screen. Very good. Very good. Zephod laughed. He was clearly very excited about something, almost childishly so. Hey, <laughs> this is really terrific. This is just far too much. What's so great about being stuck in a dust cloud? said Ford. What would you reckon to find here? urged Zephod. Nothing. No stars, no planets? No. Computer, rotate angle of vision through 180 degrees and don't talk about it. For a moment, it seemed like nothing was happening. Then a brightness glowed at the small edge of the huge screen. A red star the size of a small plate crept across it, followed quickly by another one, a binary system. 
Then a vast crescent sliced into the, op the corner of the picture, a red glare sh shading away into a deep black, the night side of a planet. I found it, cried Zaphod, thumping the console. I found it! Ford stared at it in astonishment. What is it? That, said Zaphod, is the most improbable planet that ever existed.